Japan. Their extensive history is something often overlooked in the altist community, and that's understandable, Japanese history can be fairly tough to keep track of, simply because they closed themselves off from the world for so long that they were left out of interactions with the other world powers. That changed in the 1800s when Commodore Matthew C. Perry was sent on an expedition to open Japanese ports to American trade through the use of gunboat diplomacy, which is exactly what it sounds like. The Dutch had warned the Japanese of Perry's arrival, but isolated they would remain, refusing to accept support or intervention from the European powers, which were flooding into Asia at the time, and suspected that they had only been warned so that they could wear themselves out fighting the Americans, only to be conquered by the Dutch at the end of it. Ultimately, Perry arrived, and Japan found itself subject to an unfair trade relationship with the United States. At the time, Japan had an emperor figurehead based out of Kyoto, while true governance was carried out in Edo by the Shogun. The Shogun had continued promoting the isolationist ideal, while at the same time calling for modernization to expel the foreigners from their lands before they grew too powerful. And powerful they would grow, as France, Russia, and others implemented the same tactics as the US to force trade with Japan. The Edo government kept bending over to the will of the West, signing treaties that exploited Japan and its people to prevent potential aggression from the West. Thus, the populace began flocking to the Emperor Komi, a hardliner on opposing the opening of Japanese gates to the Western invaders, and reasserting dominance over Japan for the Japanese people. Japan became increasingly polarized between the Shogun and Edo and the Emperor in Kyoto, an emperor who, mind you, still lacked legitimacy. But in the late 1850s, the Harris Treaty was proposed to grant further special privileges to American citizens within Japan. But unlike previous treaties, which were only proposed to the Shogun, this one was proposed to the Emperor, granting him political relevancy once again. The Emperor made clear he would not approve a treaty which further subjugated his people to the will of a foreign invader on his land. But the Shogun, once again, abided by the will of the West, sowing the seeds for a movement which would arise to attempt to unite the rules of the Shogun and the Emperor. And while initially it had led to some progress, almost immediately following, it had escalated tensions between the samurai and Western citizens ultimately leading Emperor Komi to declare the expulsion of foreigners in 1863. This would be followed by Japanese attacks on Western vessels and Western retaliation in Southern Japan. By this point, Japan was beginning to tear itself in two, with Southern Japan supporting the new Emperor Meiji and his samurai, who also had the support of the British, while Northern Japan stood by the shogunate who had allied themselves with France. The war had become one of Imperial Japan, those loyal to the Emperor, against the ways of Feudal Japan and the shogun who ruled it. Ironically, the anti-foreigner South had made extensive use of modernization and Western weaponry, while the North attempted to do so as well, though with far less success. Imperial forces would capture Edo and drive remaining feudal forces to establish the Northern Coalition, which too was beaten back, leaving only the island of Hokkaido remaining under feudal rule. The Izo Republic would be established out of Hokkaido to fend off the Imperial Army, though once again, they would see defeat bringing the whole of the Japanese islands under the rule of the Emperor, and establishing the Japanese Empire. But what if things went differently? What if the Shogun had managed to not necessarily win, but hold off the Empire and maintain control of the North, creating a two Japan situation? Neither side is able to advance in either direction, and a compromise is forced. What becomes of these two Japans, and how do they differ in terms of the way they develop? The Empire's Emperor Meiji still modernizes Japan, and the Japanese oligarchs still promote an ideal of a greater Japanese Empire to be achieved through the conquest of Korea, China, and Izo, but in small steps. Izo would bear witness to the advancements of the South, and begin with France a process of rapid militarization, focusing all advancements on developing a stronger navy and land force, but retaining the general quality of life in feudal Japan. This would become a policy known as military westernization and Japanese preservation, to utilize Western technology but maintain a Japanese spirit. Trade with the Western powers would become nearly exclusive to military product, while France and Russia still reap the goods of Northern Japan. Izo would preserve the feudal Japanese hierarchy and create a shogun police force to maintain order in the land, while the Empire promoted a uniting of all classes and abolishment of the old hierarchy. As was previously, the Japanese Empire would remain anti-Western, and just as in our timeline, Meiji would acknowledge that the Japanese could learn from the advancements of the West, leading to a strengthening of ties with primarily Britain, and secondarily the US, creating industry, new jobs, and an economic boom. 
Soon, as was previously stated, Meiji would need to bring an end to the class system of Old Japan, which means the abolition of the samurai who had fought to secure his authority. Saigo Nakamori would attempt to convince Meiji that the samurai were still of use, and even promoted that they be used for the conquest of Korea. In our timeline, if you've seen The Last Samurai, you know how this ends. Of course, this time around, the Japanese Empire isn't at the same level of strength it would have been in our world. There is a deficit of manpower and more importantly, skilled manpower. Most trained soldiers having defected to Izo where their skills were more revered and rewarded. The Meiji oligarchs would come to a conclusion. Time was needed to properly train the new modernized army and make out of civilians potential soldiers. The samurai would need to be ended somehow, and if that needed to be through their use in brutal battle after brutal battle, such a thing would be acceptable. Thus, the samurai would become the acting hand of the Japanese Empire, though the ruling class, with perhaps the exception of Meiji himself who was sympathetic to the samurai, would know only existed to be used until depletion. An immediate land invasion of Russian-occupied Korea would be launched while the Japanese Navy captured Port Arthur. The samurai would initially make tremendous land gains when soldiering through the south of Korea, but upon reaching Russian fortifications in the north, would find themselves victim to the onslaught of rifle and machine gun fire. While they may have been severely outgunned, the Russian army in Korea was woefully underprepared and in dire need of reinforcement. Nearly wiping out every remaining one of their numbers, the samurai finally captured the whole of Korea, but at great cost to themselves. The newly trained Japanese army would roll in to occupy the land, and the surviving samurai were either offered privileged retirement status, or sent out on another operation to conquer Taiwan as generals of the Japanese army. Some of the samurai would grow wise to the Meiji government's attempt to wipe out their class through warfare, and would defect to Izo where the warrior class was growing and finding regular use across a number of small Pacific islands, which would become trade ports for the Izo shogunate. It quickly became clear to many within the Japanese Empire that the Japanese heart and soul was being exchanged for a more Western dynamic, when viewed in contrast with Izo, who was in all fairness less developed, but strong nonetheless, and unquestionably Japanese. The adoption of Western clothing, Western technology, and Western philosophies into the Japanese Empire left many feeling disillusioned with the Emperor that their loyalty to him, like that demonstrated by the samurai, was worth nothing that they were being misguided by a false idol into a more advanced world, but one that would ultimately destroy their culture. This would drive mass defection to Izo and the proclamation that towns along the Japanese border were now Izo territory. The Japanese Empire would crack down on this descent with the establishment of a secret police to enforce obedience to the Emperor and suppress any subversive groups. The Izo Japanese border would also see reinforcement, while those sympathetic to the shogunate could face severe penalties under the Japanese government. World War I rolls around, and Japan finds itself allied to Britain, hoping to seize German colonial holdings in the Pacific. Izo, however, remains neutral and continues strengthening itself, by this point having established its own military production industry and profiting from the war by selling weaponry to both Russia and France. The war ends near identically to our timeline, and Russia erupts into civil war. Izo and Japan see this as an opportunity to seize land from the fallen empire, and repel the communists from the east. Izo's tactics and unbridled manpower carve out of the Russian Far East a safe haven and supply hub for the White Army, while the Japanese Empire secured Manchuria for itself and proceeded to keep the communists at bay for its own sake. The Trans-Siberian Railway is blockaded and cut down the middle, leaving both the Red and White Army to begin gravitating more along their strongholds in the east and west, soon bringing the war to a stalemate situation. With greater resources in the east, the White Army is able to put up a much better fight. The Reds had the advantage of Russian industry and population centers in the west, along with whatever support could be drawn from sympathetic individuals in Europe. With Izo becoming a production and military powerhouse, the White Army now has a fortification from which it can operate out of and expand from, thus leaving both Red Russia and White Russia divided between East and West, a temporary solution in the minds of both sides, who would, with whole hearts, desire nothing more than to annex their opponent, but knew the cost of life in a continued war would be exceedingly great. Izo and White Russia become very close and begin drawing inspiration from one another, leaving post-revolutionary White Russia to restructure itself in a similar hierarchical manner, and training its civilians to become a warrior people, becoming ever vigilant of the communists of the West. The Japanese Empire, though staunchly anti-communist, would find itself becoming a mirror image of the USSR to be. 
censoring dangerous ideas, silencing and imprisoning political opponents, and beginning a propaganda campaign to grow its empire and conquer its neighbor. The US of Z thanks you for watching. Support your legion by liking the video or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.